Well, good morning, Southeastern. Take your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 4, and I will catch up to you there uh, in just a moment. I am so excited to work with our Global Theological Initiative and also the centers at Southeastern. Uh, our centers provide content and conversations about uh, various subject matters from the Mission Center, our Center for Great Commission Studies, the Center for Faith and Culture, our Center for Preaching and Pastoral Leadership, and so if you need resources or advice or mobilization in any of these areas, these centers are there to serve you. We are excited in our Global Theological Initiative. We, we don't talk a lot about it publicly sometimes because of some of the places where we are. Uh, many of our students in, our, in some of the most persecuted places in the world, many others are refugees uh, who are searching for homes uh, as, they, uh, as they continue to spread around the world. So we have the, the fortunate pleasure. We hope to be in 10 languages by the end of this year. So if anybody here speaks Arabic, come to Patterson 327 and talk to Elizabeth. And we'd like to meet you because uh, we'd like to get that one nailed down. So mission fulfillment in a world like this where we have... So much craziness and lostness uh, is tough. Temptations are real, and opposition is ever-present. Last Thursday, uh, Dr. Major, Major Dr. Dr. Major Jeff Struker, Ph.D. Major, Major Dr. Jeff Struker preached about leaders who fail and fall. And uh, this could be part two of that message. We didn't plan this. I, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit did that and that I was listening and so I hope this will be helpful to us. So maybe we ought to pay attention together to this because we have a God to glorify. We have a great commission to fulfill. We have disciples to make and our own discipleship to grow. And so we need to pay attention. So how can we successfully navigate our own obedience? How, how can we navigate our service to King Jesus in this very fallen creation? And Nehemiah is going to help us. Nehemiah faced an extremely difficult context with enemies who sought to distract, that word's important to me, distract the people of God from focusing upon the mission of Yahweh. Uh, in church consulting, and I've had the privilege of consulting with a lot of churches in a lot of places, um, I see mission distraction often. It's different than what we might call simple mission drift. Uh, my wife and I grew up near a river, and we would go on what you call float trips on this river. You'd get in a canoe or an inner tube, and you'd float down the river. It wasn't whitewater rafting by any means. You wouldn't even, you wouldn't even steer except to avoid some obstacle. You just floated and drifted down the river. Uh, and that's the way sometimes mission drift is. It's almost passive. It's almost not intended. Mission distraction is much more proactive. Mission distraction involves intentionally pursuing wrong or at least lesser choices. They seem like okay things. They seem like even important things. But the priority given to them will siphon off the clear focus and the best energy from the highest, most important priorities. It's a very deceptive temptation from our enemy to lure us into this distracting chase. And I see it often. So we may accomplish our mission but we rarely will accomplish God's mission. Our study in Revelation last semester, I think, testifies to the fact that man's going to fight God till the bitter end. And so we see that. They hate what they cannot control. They hate what they cannot cancel. But when our Lord chooses to act, don't miss this, when our Lord chooses to act, he will not be ignored and he cannot be denied. Demons will rush into herds of swine that go flying off of cliff sides into the seas and entire villages will know about it. But it doesn't necessarily mean the whole village believes. Enemies will always challenge every major movement of God. Charles Spurgeon once said, he said, God had one son without sin, but he never had a son without trial. So how will we face the temptation of distraction? How will we respond, uh, and how can we make it an opportunity to grow rather than a moment of failing? See, the Hebrews failed, and God used Babylon to take them into exile until Persia conquered them and allowed them to begin to return. And the first group returns to rebuild the temple, but the enemies in the land discourage them, so all they get done is the foundation. The prophets Haggai and Zechariah come to encourage them. Finally, Ezra comes with another group and gets them to repent. And finally, finally, the temple is done, but the walls and the gates of the city are still in shambles and the gates are still burned. So Nehemiah gets a report of this while he's serving the king in Persia and he feels like it's a, 
a calling from God for him to go back, a burden to go back and help them to build. How could they worship? How could his people worship? How could his people be a testimony to God's promise when all around them was in ruins, when their enemies surrounded them and they had no real protection? And that takes us to Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. So he returns and the enemies rise up to stop him. How will we face such opposition? But it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. I just want to share some things that I think Nehemiah helps us to understand when we face opposition, but when we're also fully determined, when we're determined to focus on the mission of God, first of all, we must expect external opposition. Sanballat, the governor of Samaria, was furious and indignant, this translation says. It might say hot and angry. He wasn't just upset. He was raging mad. He knew that if Jerusalem was refortified, that they would lose their power and control over the region. So that couldn't be. So he sought to humiliate. He sought to discourage. He sought to cause doubt. What are these feeble Jews doing? You're too feeble. You're not good enough. You'll never succeed. You ever hear those voices in your heart? Look around you. All is hopeless. You can't build on a pile of burned rubbish. Just give up. And Tobiah the Ammonite joins in. By saying even the weight of a little fox, which smashed the wall, it's weak, you're weak, and you'll fail, and you'll fall. Interesting that archaeologists have discovered that the walls of Nehemiah were about nine feet thick. That'd be one big old fat fox. But don't be naive. Enemies are going to seek to cause mission distraction. They will lie to you, and they will lie about you. And they will attempt to make you believe the task is impossible. You can even expect former enemies to come together and join forces. Like Sambalat and Tobiah, they shouldn't have been friends. They should have been competitors over the region. But it's interesting when a common threat brings strange teammates together. I've seen that in my lifetime, I think. So Satan distracts by tempting us to focus on the obstacles we face instead of upon God and his promises. If you have no opposition, though, perhaps you're not doing enough. Maybe you're not doing enough to even catch the enemy's attention. It's kind of like Churchill once said. He said, you have enemies? Good. That means you stood for something sometime in your life. Or as one of my favorite preachers of all time, Chuck Lawless, said in one of my favorite sermons of Dr. Lawless's, he he preaches out of the book of Acts, and he asks the question, does the enemy know your name? Nehemiah would have none of it. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He obeyed the Lord. He was determined. He was focused to accomplish God's mission. Look at verse 4. It says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn your reproach upon their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. Nehemiah knew that prayer was a primary weapon, and he asked God to fight for them. Don't you ever take prayer lightly or think it's an afterthought. It's the first thought. It's a a front-line weapon in our battle in this world. But he left justice to the Lord, if you notice. (laughs) He he made a point. He asked God to take care of the enemies, uh, but to not forget their sins. There's no misunderstanding his words in this prayer. He believed God would remember. You know, it's interesting, the Bible commands us to love our enemies, but that doesn't mean we don't seek God's justice as well. As Gilbert Keith Chesterton once said in in a commentary, he said, the Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies, probably because they are generally the same people. God will remember those who oppose his mission. He will. So we need to respond with prayer and continue moving forward, staying focused on building, not wasting time responding 
to ungodly distractions. Look at verse 6. So we built the wall. That's what they did. They worked. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. It's interesting because what we see is that they were determined and had an intentional focus on the mission, for the people had a mind to work. They were dedicated. And this angered the enemies even more, even to the point that the old Ashdodites, those are the Philistines, the old Ashdodites show up. Old enemies will often arise. They'll come out of the woodwork. They'll join up with those strange teammates and work together when you least expect them. And they all devise a plan of attack. How does Nehemiah respond? Prayer and preparation. Takes some practical action. He stays focused. He seeks the Lord. He works hard. And he takes practical and spiritual action. He even assigns around-the-clock security duty. Vigilant warrior leaders guarding against the enemy. That's a good picture of the church. That's a good picture of how we ought to be working together. A good picture of wisdom as we move forward in God's mission. Because when you're fully determined to focus on the mission of God, you got to expect external opposition. But you also better be prepared, secondly, to respond to internal problems. Stuff will happen on the inside, too. Look at verse 10. Then Judah said... The strength of the laborers is failing, and there's so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times, from whatever place you turn, they'll be upon us. Sadly, there were those on the inside who, who agreed with those on the outside and thought the task was too great. They, they felt overwhelmed. They felt distracted from the mission. It says that they were failing, which means to stumble or totter. It's this idea of, think of a, a worker carrying a heavy, heavy load about to fall over because of the weight. Plus, there was just so much rubbish to be cleared. You can't build on rubbish. Solid foundations are a must. Those ruins also represented, you got to think about this, past defeat. The fact that the walls had fallen down and the gates were burned, that was a testimony to Babylon. That was a testimony to their failures. That was a testimony to their sin, to everything they'd done wrong. And failures of the past needed to be cleared away. Those historic wrong loves and those historic wrong fears Those wrong loves and those wrong fears become idolatry for us if we're not careful and weaken us and distract us. So we have to replace them with the proper loves and fears of God or we're just going to try to build on a pile of rubbish. And interesting in this passage, those living near the enemies were constantly telling those who wanted to build of the threat They they just spoke of gloom and doom repeatedly. When your own people start speaking nonstop about fear, it is so discouraging when you're trying to move forward. Are you surrounded by people who are so negative and so fearful all the time? Maybe they were more focused on the opposition than they were on what God was calling them to do. Maybe they were just a little too close. Maybe they spent a little too much time listening to the wrong voices or reading the wrong posts and reposting them to everyone they knew over and over again. My friends, it's rubbish. From whatever place you turn, they'll be upon us. Some seek to dwell in a dumpster full of rubbish, I think, rather than allowing God's grace to haul it away. No hope or faith in God's ability, no seeking his face, just the enemy's opposition, determination versus distraction. In my pocket, I have a little coin. This little coin, this is a a small copper coin. You won't be able to see it from where you are. Just believe I have a little copper coin in my hand. This is called a tambala. This comes from Malawi. I've had this little coin for over 20 years. When I got this coin 20-something years ago, I think it was worth one-sixteenth of one-hundredth of a penny. 
I mean, you couldn't make a more worthless piece of currency than a tambala. It must cost a thousand times more to make a tambala than the tambala is actually worth. I pray the nation of Malawi no longer makes tambalas. It's about as worthless a coin as you could find. But let me tell you something, my friends. When you hold it right in front of your eye and that's all you see, my whole world is tambala, tambala, tambala. That's all there is. Sometimes that's how I find church leaders. Sometimes that's how I find students. They've got the wrong things too close, and that's all they see. It would have been so easy for Nehemiah to just throw up his hands and say, well, that's it. I'm, I quit. I'm heading back to Persia. I live, in the, I live in the palace back there. I don't need this. And many are going to do that. They're going to cut and run when they remember something being better or, or when things get hard. When the enemy attacks or they hear negative words from others, they give up and quit. But what if, what if you're truly missing out on a movement of God that's just getting ready to start? You better expect warfare, even from within, when he's about to do something very special. Listen, Nehemiah took spiritual and practical steps. He's a man of prayer and action, and he knew he needed to strengthen his people. He, he reminds them of their true source of of power. Look at verse 13. He says, Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember, the Lord is great and awesome. And fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. So we better be prepared. To deal with mission weariness and the need to motivate, to inspire, and take practical steps to help. Guards are posted and they're armed with swords, spears, and bows. These are weapons designed for both long range and hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were ready for attack from any angle. Be prepared, be on guard, be ready for battle. And Nehemiah inspires the troops by appealing to their faith in God and their desire to protect their families. We serve a great and awesome God who works and fights on our behalf. Will we respond in faith or fail in fear? Because the enemy's going to do all he can to stop us from moving forward. And we have to be determined to remain focused. Yet our, the critics would not give up. Look at verse 15. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held, held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Now go on to verse 20. And wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there, our God will fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem, that he may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So when you're determined, when you're fully focused to move forward in God's mission, you got to expect opposition from the outside. You need to be re responding to the internal problems you face. But number three, you have to press on with sacrificial faith. So see God's intent. See God's commitment to his own mission. Verse 15, God had brought their plot to nothing. And Nehemiah recognizes that God is doing this. God is at work. And, and, and God seeks for his mission to be fulfilled. I mean, we count on that. We have to. In, in our global theological initiative world, we have people in persecuted places. We count on God to protect them and to help them as they face real issues every single day we count on him and, and, and he reminded them in verse 20 our god will fight for us we but we also have this responsibility of determination so nehemiah assigns weapons in one hand tools in the other the sword and the trowel it's a good image for us well-armed alert guards have a way to force the enemy to reconsider the, their ambush tactics and our commitment to his mission will require sacrifice. How far are you willing to go for mission fulfillment? So no one involved in the rebuilding was even allowed to leave at night. <laughs> they couldn't even go home. They kept working. 
In fact, look at verse 23. They didn't even take time to change clothes. Verse 23 says, So neither I nor my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. Well, praise the Lord for that. Working on a wall all day in the Middle East. It's interesting because those last three words in Hebrew could be translated, each man his weapon, the water. In other words, the idea here is this idea of constant preparedness. They were always ready. They were intensely, intentionally determined, even in the face of great sacrifice. Now, distractions, problems, and needs continue in chapter 5. And I wish we had time to look at all that, but we don't. So I want you to go to chapter 6, because I want us to focus on a couple of more pieces to this before we go. They, they had years of struggle marked, uh, marked with, with rebuilding, with the rubbish, the ruins of their past. They were struggling with some of those problems in chapter 5. And though the work was nearing completion, their enemies still did not stop. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, although at the time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. See, when you're determined to be fully focused on the mission of God, expect external opposition. Respond to internal problems uh, and press on with sacrificial faith. And then finally, I want to spend the rest of my time on number four. Respond to criticism with truth and prayer. The enemies grew more desperate. They know that this is getting done. The walls are about there. The closer you are to fulfilling God's mission the more intensely the enemy is likely to attack. So they tempt Nehemiah to stop his work and to come down from there and to sit with them and to debate with them. Stop working up there and come down where we are and meet with us. Stop the work of God and sit around the table with us. Let me tell you something, friends. Stopping the work of God and sitting around the table with the enemy is a dangerous place to be. The truth was stop the work so we can distract you away from it. We can destroy you. Quit being focused on what God has called you to and waste your time and energy on us down on our level. But Nehemiah knew the truth. Nehemiah would not be stopped, and he had no time to stop and fall into the enemy's deceitful snares. Look at verse 3. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? I want to say that differently. Go down to you. I think that was better. But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Listen, the name of God and his people were at stake. Those stones in that wall represented a whole lot more than some physical wall. They represented a people restored, a people, uh, a people protected. They represented God's mission and promise to bring a remnant of his people back out of exile and to restore them so that they could worship him and bring him glory. And he knew who these guys were. The passage says, our enemies. That doesn't mean we don't love them. That doesn't mean that we don't pray that they'd be saved or that they would be restored somehow, but it does mean we're not naive about their intentions and desires. Do not allow them to divert your attention from the great work God has called you to do by what they define as good or urgent or important. Man loves to create his own truth and then urgently expects you to live by it. This is more important. This should have your focus, they'll say. And they were persistent. They were persistent and posted, I mean sent, message after message to stop the work of the Lord, for him to come down, sit with them, and waste time. Repeatedly, the attacks and temptations will come. So anticipate and be determined about the Lord's mission so you cannot be deceived or distracted. Look at verse 5. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says, I mean, if Geshem says so, it must be true, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. 
And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There's a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. See, when they recognized they could not gold him into some private debate with them, they went public and threatened to turn public opinion against him. And he sent an unsealed letter to intimidate Nehemiah, meant to be read by the people and the other leaders in Jerusalem. Send Balat spread rumors that Nehemiah was doing all of this to lead the people to rebel against the Persian king. And he hoped other people would read it and help spread the rumors. Gossip and slander are like that. They don't like to be caged. They don't like to be controlled. They want others to hear and believe in them. They seek to bully and intimidate. And my dear sweet wife, Teresa, here will tell you, I don't like bullies. Destructive, inaccurate motive attribution is a curse in modern-day evangelical life. This is really why they're doing what they're doing, when in fact that's not true at all and you don't even know what you're talking about, but you're basing your truth on gossip you've heard or by forming some unsupported opinion. Believe it or not, I used to direct our doctor of ministry program here. Southeastern used to be really desperate. And, uh, and I directed our doctor of ministry program, and I read all these doctoral papers. And I used to be called Dr. Red Ink. By the way, I marked them. Because in those days, you actually used a red pen. And I, I had a code for grading, and one of my codes was UO, unsupported opinion. See, in academic writing, you have to have citations. You have to have footnotes. You, can, you can't just state your own opinion and get away with it. And sometimes, my friends, I just want to run around this world screaming, UO, UO. But the enemy won't give up, and the enemy won't shut up. So if Satan can't distract you personally, he'll tempt others to spread rumors and misrepresent your motives. Hawkins writes, O.S. Hawkins writes, just watch. If a Christian is all out for, the souls, and, uh, for souls and has a heart for God, he will most, most likely will become the target for other people's tongues. Or as our president, Dr. Aiken, once said, naysayers don't have to be right. They just have to be loud. Don't be surprised when Satan fabricates lies about you if you're determined to fulfill God's mission. He's the father of lies. These are his children. But remember, Nehemiah knew how to respond. He responded with truth and prayer. Lies must be fought with prayerful communication with the source of real truth. When we speak truth, God can be glorified. He, he rejected their lies and refused to entertain or waste time on these false rumors. Look at verse 8. He says, Then I sent to him, saying, No such thing as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they, were all, for they all were trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. See, Nehemiah wasn't concerned about what others thought. He was far more concerned about what God thought. And so passionately work to be and to make followers of Christ, not followers of yourself. He had one passion, his mission from Yahweh. And a person following the Lord that close, he's going to be able to see and sniff out the enemy's tactics. Their spiritual discernment is more mature. It's more refined. And so he responds by praying to God for strength. See that pattern throughout the life of Nehemiah. He relied upon and trusted God for his strength and ability. I believe in what you say, O Lord. Therefore, I don't have to fear what man says. But the enemy still didn't give up. Look at verse 10. We're about to be done. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was a secret informer. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come to kill you. Never underestimate the length to which the enemy will go. He'll seek insiders, just like he found Judas. He'll find others. And there will be those who call themselves believers, but they don't seek the ways of God. There will even be those who call themselves believers, but criticize or seek to defeat those who do want to follow the will of God. And here a man, a prophet, maybe a priest, if his father, as the priest mentioned in 1 Chronicles 24, urged Nehemiah to flee to the temple and to hide there. You're going to be defeated, Nehemiah. So choose to protect yourself. Choose to be safe. Stop the work. 
protect yourself and retreat. And I know leaders like this who were once on fire for the Lord but are now defeated and chose to compromise their mission. If we cannot trick you, if we cannot shame you, maybe we can get you to make bad choices of defeat. Can't you just hear the snake whispering? Think of yourself, Nehemiah. Save yourself. You can't win. You're not able. You're defeated. But listen to what he says in verse 11. And I said, should such a man as me, as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he had pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. For this reason he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way in sin so that they might have cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. My God, remember Tobiah and Sambalat, according to these their works, and the prophetess uh, Noadiah, Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who have made me afraid. Hiding in the temple was not where Nehemiah belonged. And there was provision in the law for the court of the temple to be a place of safety and sanctuary when you were fleeing from others who were after you. But it also states that only the priest could actually enter the building. Non-priests would enter the building with the threat of death. King Uzziah entered the building and got leprosy. So this false prophet was not declaring a word from God, but rather a word from the enemies who hired him. Personal protection is not worth the price it might cost. Nehemiah was committed to the mission, not personal, not personal protection or promotion. So nothing was going to defeat him as long as he walked with God. Listen, Satan doesn't want you to deny yourself. He doesn't want you to take up a cross daily. He doesn't want you to choose to pay the full price of true discipleship. Easy Christianity where your felt needs are going to be met exactly the way you want them to be, where all your itches are scratched uh, to your personal satisfaction, but where there, there's no expectation of sacrifice. There's no expectation of service. That is so common. I, I, I make a, a partial living out of being a church consultant from churches who call me, and I have to talk to them about the decisions of defeat that they've made that have led them to to the current positions of absolute spiritual impotency that they find themselves in. And I say it just about like that to them. People love me. Defeated churches where I can simply attend as a spectator or a critic with no real personal investment, they're all around the world. So let's finish this up. Nehemiah could not be persuaded to live in defeat. So look at this, verse 15 and 16, and I'm going to stop right after this. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. It's pretty amazing. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Isn't that something? See what God does when his people are determined. He creates a testimony for himself through us. He, he receives the credit. He receives the glory. You don't see Nehemiah taking the credit for it. There's no bronze plaque on that wall with Nehemiah's name on it. He's praising the Lord. It's an amazing feat because that's the very business of God. And in this, in this world of apathy, in this world of rebellion, God is looking for a people through which to do the miraculous. And so despite the threats and the plots and distractions he's looking for a people who choose to seek him and hope for his glory so my friends it's been 13 years since I preached in chapel so I felt like I needed to make the most of it today because take a look at me I'm not gonna last another 13 years I can barely make it up these steps so hear me southeastern we must not be distracted we must not be drawn away by those who seek to distract us from his mission. We must never stop pushing forward. We must just keep relentlessly moving forward on mission. Like Nehemiah, we must remain focused, stacking one rock at a time and finding another one. The work must continue. There's too much at stake. The global church is at stake. The lost of this world are at stake, and we must seek the glory of God and join him in redeeming the nations, and we must not seek the glory of man or appease those who wish we would stop the important work of God, go down and sink to their level, and sit at their table and debate their opinions. I'm sorry, enemies. 
I believe will just remain focused and keep moving forward in the work and worship of King Jesus. The people who work for me know that I am very motivated by an old quote by William Carey, the missionary. It's a quote that many of you have already heard. But after many, many years of difficult missions work, uh, an author asked him, uh, how, did he, how did he make it through all that? What was his secret after this 40-year missionary career where he, he suffered and went through so much? And this was his response. He said, I can plod, P-L-O-D. I can plod. I can persevere in any definite pursuit to this I owe everything. Southeastern, we just got to keep coming. And we're just going to keep coming. And we're just going to keep coming. And we're going to see people saved. And we're going to see churches planted. And we're going to see nations reached. And we're going to see God glorified. Because he has a plan. And he has a mission for us. Will you be determined? Or will you be distracted? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that I don't have to make stuff up. That, Father, you have it all right here for us. And, Father, I just pray that you will help us to be people of prayer and truth. That, Father, we will focus on what it is you want us to do. And that, Father, we will continue to move forward. And that we will never stop. Lord, we know that there will be uh, an enemy who seeks to stop us. We know that in this fallen creation we will have those who criticize us. But, Father, I just pray that you'll give us the strength to stay focused on you. This is your mission. This is not ours. This is your plan. It's not ours. This is your life. It's not ours. We've been bought with a price. We don't even exist, Father. You exist. So help us, Father, to continue to just move forward in your will and your plan for our lives. Father, help these students, even in their studies, to recognize that's part of moving forward. The preparation, the equipping, the training is part of moving forward. But then, Father, I pray that they will go and share what they've learned with others, especially with those who do not know you. In Christ's name, amen.